I want to be upfront with you out there watching this video. Generally speaking, I only do videos on the definitive way to play a game only if I truly believe that. And for years now, after the success of my video for the first Sonic Adventure, I got a lot of requests to do one for Sonic Adventure 2. The rub being that I did not believe there was a definitive way to play that game. I've said it before, but I don't make these mods. I'm just the messenger that tells you they're available, how to use them, and why they're important. And if those mods don't exist, then I'm not going to make a video about it. It's as simple as that. Over the last two or three years, Sonic Adventure 2 PC modding has grown considerably. But it still never quite reached a point where I felt satisfied with the end results. And to be honest, as of this writing, it still hasn't. There are some sticking points that don't perfectly replicate the experience of playing Sonic Adventure 2 in the way it was made to be played. That being said, I feel like it's close enough now that I need to stop being such a perfectionist and realize that for most of you out there, this is what you've been waiting for. Some of you might be confused, because if I'm not totally happy with this, does it really deserve to be called the definitive way to play? Well, for starters, the almost but not quite definitive way to play Sonic Adventure 2 is kind of a mouthful as far as video titles go. But more importantly, I've spoken to a lot of people, and based on how everyone else plays Sonic Adventure 2, I've come to realize that the thing I was being picky about doesn't really matter. Sometimes being 100% faithful to the original release isn't actually better. It may not be my definitive edition of Sonic Adventure 2, but there's a highly likely chance it will be yours. If you stick around, I'll tell you all about it and give you a list of mods and how to set them up in order to make Sonic Adventure 2 look and feel way, way better. But before we get to that, I want to tell you about an offer from this video sponsor. Now, I don't get sponsors very often, so just hear me out. First of all, hi, hello, my name is Ryan, better known to the internet as Blaze Hedgehog, and I've been a creator for a long time. If you did not know, I am the original founder of Sage, the annual celebration of fan games and increasingly indie games. I care about this kind of stuff a lot, and I myself have been dabbling in game development since 1998, and even with that much time under my belt, there's a lot I still don't know. Though game development is more accessible now than it ever has been, it's still not very easy. Luckily, there's places like Southern New Hampshire University, this video sponsor. SNHU has one of the largest accredited non-profit online degree offerings in the country. If you've ever wanted to know how games are created, they can help you learn important game development skills like understanding game physics, working with artificial intelligence, and designing graphics. They'll even teach you programming. Not only will this help you create your own entire games, but if you, say, wanted to develop your own mods for a game like Sonic Adventure 2, SNHU's game development courses will get you started down the road so that one day you might be able to insert your own OCs into the game as playable characters. SNHU offers more than just game development, too, if you'd like to broaden your horizons. They're very affordable as well, with SNHU's tuition rates being less than half of many colleges, and some of the lowest rates in the nation. To learn more, just visit snhu.edu slash blazehedgehog and sign up to get your free information. There's a link down in the description. While you're there, check out the average annual salary for a computer programmer. It's pretty impressive stuff. And I mean, heck, colleges like this aren't just for teens and young adults. Even somebody like me who's over 35 could sign up, especially with the online courses they offer. I know it's a cliche, but somebody once said that you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, so why not take the shot with SNHU? It won't cost you anything to sign up and learn more information, but it could be the first step towards the career of your dreams. The only way to know for sure is to check it out for yourself, so click the link in the description and learn more today. Released in 1998 in Japan and 1999 in America, the original Sonic Adventure was a pretty ambitious game for its era, featuring six playable characters, an overworld to explore, and multiple hours of fully voiced cinematics, it was a step above most 3D platformers at the time. And yet, at least personally, I found it a little underwhelming. Compared to contemporary games like Donkey Kong 64 and Crash Bandicoot 3, I didn't think Sonic Adventure looked like a significant advancement in technology with its oven mitt hands and simple animations. It's a completely surface level observation, and I definitely appreciated Sonic Adventure's gameplay more than its graphics, but I personally felt it was hard to look at this game and not feel a pang of disappointment. 
By comparison, Sonic Adventure 2 released less than two years later, and looked much more like the game that I was expecting in terms of visuals. It's a game that is a generational leap in every aspect. Smoother gameplay, more detailed characters and animations, and vastly improved cinematics. With graphics like this, it's hard to believe both games are even on the same hardware. But it also came at a time of great transition for Sega. Sonic Adventure 2 released for the Dreamcast in June of 2001, but Sega announced the death of the Dreamcast six months prior in January. The Dreamcast was now walking Sega's Green Mile, and Sonic Adventure 2 was its swan song. Sega had been briefly considered one of the kings of the game industry, a worthy rival to the top names in the business, but in the five years following the Sega Genesis, they had wasted almost all of that potential. They had failed, and they were just another game developer now. For the first time in many years, that meant releasing their products on hardware not manufactured by Sega. And it started with the release of Sonic Adventure 2 Battle for the Nintendo GameCube just six months after it released on the Dreamcast in December of that same year. Though it was a port of the Dreamcast game, it featured a greater emphasis on the game's multiplayer component, hence the subtitle of Battle. Oddly enough, Sonic Adventure 2 never made it onto any other platforms at the time. While other Sega franchises like Crazy Taxi spread out across the PlayStation 2 and Xbox, Sonic Adventure 2 parked on the GameCube and stayed there for the next 11 years. That finally changed in 2012, when Sega released a high-definition remaster of Sonic Adventure 2 for the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and personal computer. Though it was based on the GameCube release of the game, it was actually sold in two parts. The main story campaign and a separate battle mode DLC for $3 that included the multiplayer component. At first glance, the 2012 port of Sonic Adventure 2 might not seem so bad. Unlike the original Sonic Adventure, which had its art direction significantly changed for its update, Sonic Adventure 2 Battle keeps the look and feel of the original Dreamcast game, for the most part. That's mostly down to the circumstances it was developed under. For most games, developing a sequel causes an increase in development staff as you get bigger and more ambitious. For Sonic Adventure 2, this was the opposite. As I said earlier, Sonic Adventure was a pretty ambitious game, and a Dreamcast launch title. It was a huge undertaking for Sega, with a development time of nearly three years. According to Moby Games, nearly 300 developers worked on Sonic Adventure, and for 1998, that was a big number. These were not luxuries afforded to its sequel. By comparison, half as many people worked on Sonic Adventure 2 in half the time and on a game that was considerably more simplified compared to the original. Though it still contained six playable characters, it only contained three gameplay styles, speed, hunting, and shooting. It also axed the overworld segments entirely and was just generally a shorter game overall with copious amounts of recycled assets. That checks out when you consider that for the last six months of its 20-month development cycle, more than one-fourth of its total development time as a whole, Sonic Team had to start learning how to create games for the Nintendo GameCube as well. So one would expect that not only were there fewer developers creating a smaller, shorter game in less time, but they were also undoubtedly learning to cope with becoming first-time third-party developers. Being one of Sega's premier development groups, Sonic Team had exclusive access to a deep knowledge base about how Sega's hardware worked. In some cases, Sonic Team probably helped write the documentation that all other game developers would use to create software for platforms like the Saturn and the Dreamcast. When it came to creating games with the best graphics or the most advanced technical systems, being a part of Sega gave Sonic Team an advantage on platforms like the Dreamcast that no other outside game developer could ever have. When it came to developing a game on something like the GameCube, Sonic Team was now in the same boat as everybody else. That special insider information was gone. For the first time in their careers, they were now just regular, common game developers, fighting for the same market as other studios like Capcom, Konami, and Activision. That couldn't have been easy for them, especially considering the circumstances. This meant that Sonic Adventure 2 Battle didn't have a lot of time for improvement. At a glance, the GameCube version looks nearly identical to its Dreamcast original, save for some minor enhancements to visual effects. Character models have a little more detail, and a few levels have added flourishes, like extra architecture or enhanced weather. 
But deep down, Sonic Adventure 2 suffered a number of more adverse changes in its transition to Nintendo's platform. Those enhanced visuals caused headaches with the way Sonic Adventure 2's characters were rendered during cutscenes. Instead of creating a single Sonic model and using that across every cinematic sequence, Sonic Adventure 2 had dozens of different models for each individual character. On the surface, they look nearly identical, but all of them have been customized to fit a given scene. This made it very difficult for Sega to upgrade the visuals, as it would have meant modifying every single copy of every single asset one by one. As a result, cinematics in Sonic Adventure 2 Battle will often randomly switch between higher detail GameCube models and the old Dreamcast assets at random. I'm sure it wouldn't have been a problem if the game development team had more time and more resources, but with less than a year to get the GameCube version ready to go while also simultaneously finishing and shipping the Dreamcast version, cutbacks had to be made somewhere. These cutbacks had a more adverse effect on the cinematics overall. See for yourself. Some cutscenes are missing textures, like when the camera here pans over to show Tails driving away. There are strange modifications to animations, like how often Amy Rose seems to go cross-eyed. There are missing lighting effects, like the shadow on the bars here in Sonic's jail cell. The lighting in general is also just wrong, with characters appearing too dark or missing lighting entirely, which is to say nothing of other missing or incorrect effects in general. And then there's problems with Sonic Adventure 2's audio mixing. Sonic Adventure 2 always had mixing problems anyway, and as I've been told, that's down to the Dreamcast hardware. Now, I tried to do some research to verify this, and I couldn't find any mention of it online, but I remember hearing that the Dreamcast's DSP, that is, the Digital Sound Processor hardware, came with a special built-in mixer to make sure that audio coming out of the console always sounded great. It did this by applying a special audio compressor so that anything that was too loud would have its volume cut down to acceptable listening levels. Some developers at Sega apparently used this to their advantage by deliberately playing some sounds extra loud knowing that the compressor would catch and fix them. By doing this, the blown out audio would sound extra harsh and crunchy, but it wouldn't damage your speakers or your hearing. Because of this, particularly in the case of Sonic Adventure 2 when porting the game to other platforms, it has obvious sound balancing issues because it's being run on platforms that don't have the Dreamcast's unique DSP chip, and Sega never adjusted the volume levels for the different hardware. But that's assuming what I heard all those years ago is true, anyway. Again, I couldn't find a source for this, so if anyone knows what I'm talking about, drop a comment. Maybe I'm just crazy. And of course, all of this is on top of the basic sound problems that Sonic Adventure 2 just has by default. That blue hedgehog again of all places. I found you, Faker. Faker? I think you're the fake hedgehog around here. You're comparing yourself to me? Huh, you're not even good enough to be I'll my- I'll make you eat those words. Under the hood, Sonic Adventure 2's controls changed for the worse as well. In general, Sega game ports seem to suffer from a number of issues with analog stick input. Whether it's Nights into Dreams, Crazy Taxi, or Jet Set Radio, something about the way Sega reads and uses analog sticks in games has problems when ported to other platforms. Sonic Adventure 2 is no different, with the GameCube version suffering from oddities related to accurate homing attack targeting. The best demonstration I can think of is in Metal Harbor when you come across this group of robots suspended over a bottomless pit. In the Dreamcast version, you can quickly tap the button and guide Sonic with the analog stick to take the long route out here for some bonus points and a free one up. On the GameCube version of Sonic Adventure 2, tapping the button too quickly will force you to always take the shortest path. To take the longer route and get the bonuses, you have to get to this enemy and wait for Sonic to bounce up a little bit before retargeting. It may seem insignificant, but it suggests a change to Sonic Adventure 2's code, and overall, I find myself missing homing attacks a little more frequently in SA2 Battle. Not tons, but enough that it's noticeable. And when it came time to remaster Sonic Adventure 2 in high definition in 2012, Sega used the GameCube version as a base, warts and all. All of the busted cutscenes and wonky controls carried over to the high definition update. Here, the analog stick input gets even worse, in particular with how the game handles grind rails. 
And it's here I'd like to take a little bit of a sidebar, because in talking to other people about Sonic Adventure 2, I learned that no matter which version of the game it is, a lot of people apparently never understood how grind rails work. Which is why I'm going to break it down for you now in a little segment I like to call Sonic the Hedgehog's Pro Grinder. Uh, no, not, not like that. Come on. Okay, so there are five main mechanics to rails. One is just basic grinding. You land on a rail and you slide down it. Easy. Two is ducking. While on a rail, Sonic and Shadow tuck their bodies inwards and streamline to wind resistance, allowing them to go faster, which is particularly useful on downward slopes. The third is leaning. While grinding on a rail, you can push either left or right on the analog stick to make your character lean in that direction and potentially build up more speed. More on that in a second. Fourth, we have rail swapping. By leaning in a direction and pressing jump, your character will do a short hop between nearby rails. And lastly, we have the trick system. When the very end of a grind rail curves upwards, pressing the jump button just before the end will cause your character to do a trick for bonus points. Rails in Sonic's last level have special green markers to point this out, but in reality it works on any grind rail in every level, just as long as it curves in the right way. There's a chance that for some of you out there, I've already blown your minds with something I just said, but the thing that shocked me is that most people don't understand the leaning system whatsoever. By successfully learning how, when, and where to duck and lean, you can go significantly faster than normal, and there are often score bonuses for going fast on rails. I suppose the problem here is that a lot of the systems built into grinding on rails feel totally optional, and the game never signals to the player when they're doing anything wrong. If all you do is slide down the rail without touching any of the other buttons, then it kind of looks normal. Just kind of slow, I guess. And Sonic Adventure 2 doesn't really communicate how these systems interact with each other either. So if you grew up playing this game and never really understood how any of this worked, well, I can't really blame you. What you're supposed to be doing in the way that I've always played Sonic Adventure 2 is to constantly duck. Ducking on straightaways helps you build up speed very quickly, but ducking during a turn will often show your character losing their balance and you'll slow down. So what you have to do is that while ducking, you use the leaning system to lean into turns and maintain your balance. If the grind rail is banking to the right, you push the analog stick in the same direction and lean into the turn. This allows you to constantly build up more speed no matter which direction a rail is going. To me, it's simple physics. If you've ever ridden a bike before, you probably know that when you make a turn at high speeds, you often have to lean into the turn in order to shift your weight and maintain balance. It's the same concept here. And you can't usually just jam the analog stick all the way in one direction either. Like riding a bike, it's about using finesse and maintaining your balance. If you're ducking and lean too far, or even not lean far enough, then you risk losing your balance and in some cases, even falling off the rail entirely. And it's this system that is completely broken in the HD version of Sonic Adventure 2 from 2012. Basically, the analog stick detection for leaning on rails is way too sensitive. You have to be insanely gentle with how you feather the analog stick in the HD version, or else the game throws Sonic's balance off and slows you down. Given I've spoken to nearly a dozen people now that never knew how the grind rail leaning system worked, I assume testers never even knew it was broken to begin with. To some people, it's always been totally inscrutable. This grind rail system carried forward to other games, too. A similar, if not nearly identical, grind rail system was present in Sonic Heroes. There, tapping the action button pushes you forward, but if you keep holding the button, it serves the same purpose as ducking in Sonic Adventure 2. There are even animations in Sonic Unleashed to suggest a rail balance system may have been considered for that game. You can push left or right on the analog stick and hold down the B button to see them, but they have no gameplay function. Okay, so now that we know later versions of Sonic Adventure 2 were broken after they left the Dreamcast, how do we fix it? Well, unfortunately, unlike with Sonic Adventure, there are no easy mod pack installers as of this recording. You will have to go through and install each mod individually one by one. There are around seven mods I consider essential for playing Sonic Adventure 2 on the PC, plus another seven that are fun to play around with. It's not that hard all told, but things are about to get a little more technical, so brace yourself. But also don't worry, 
I'll walk you through setting them all up one by one, and there will always be links and up-to-date information in the video description. This isn't that hard once it's all explained, just pay attention, watch closely, and don't be afraid to pause the video if you need to. I'll always be here when you come back. And one more thing before we begin, but I need to be clear about something. This is only for the 2012 PC version of Sonic Adventure 2. I've gotten a handful of comments on my original Sonic Adventure video about this, so no. These mods cannot be installed on the Xbox 360 version, they cannot be installed on the GameCube version, and they cannot be installed on any other version besides the official 2012 PC version released on Steam. If you own a Steam Deck and want to play the modded version of Sonic Adventure 2 there, well, then you're on your own. I can't afford these $600 for a Steam Deck right now, so unless Valve or someone else drops one in my lap, I don't know how that thing works. It's possible these mods work on the Steam Deck, since the Steam Deck runs a Windows emulator for a lot of games. But that's going to be something you figure out, not me. Right, with all of that out of the way, the first thing you're going to want to do is grab the Sonic Adventure 2 Mod Loader. This is the key piece of software that makes all of this possible. You can download it from either Game Banana or Sonic Retro. If you don't already have it on your system, go ahead and install Sonic Adventure 2, and then install the Mod Loader by unzipping it into the same folder as your Sonic Adventure 2 executable. This is pretty easy to get to. In Steam, right-click Sonic Adventure 2, click on Manage, and then Browse Local Files. This will open the folder that Sonic Adventure 2 is installed to. So just copy the files in there. Once you have your files, launch sa2modmanager.exe. If it asks you about an update, just say yes and wait for it to finish. Now that the mod manager is open, scroll down here and click Install Loader. This will modify your Sonic Adventure 2 install a little bit so that it can insert the mod data while you play. You may notice that there are a lot of tabs up here for settings. Before we install any mods, let's run through them one by one. Codes are obviously for cheat codes. Turn these on and off if you want to, but I would recommend enabling at least two. The first cheat code I would enable would be the Reduce Spin Dash Delay. Sonic Adventure 2 typically has you hold down the action button for a long time before it'll start a spin dash, and this shortens that delay. The second one you should enable is the All Emeralds Trackable in Treasure Hunt stages. This changes the Emerald Radar to work in the same way it does in the original Sonic Adventure. By default, Sonic Adventure 2 only tracks one emerald at a time, which means that you could run past an emerald piece and never even realize it. When you turn this cheat on, all emeralds will show on the radar at the same time, making the Knuckles and Rouge stages just a little easier. That being said, this code does come with one small glitch. The radar sound for the other two emeralds will be completely silent. If that bothers you, stay tuned because there's a mod later on in this video that may interest you. Otherwise, turn the cheat code on and have fun. The next tab is for graphics settings. If Sonic Adventure 2 is already running fine for you, then you probably don't need to touch any of these options. That being said, it might help to check the lock frame rate box. If you've ever played the PC version of Sonic Adventure 2 and found it to be running too fast, that's because it's trying to match your monitor's refresh rate. Sonic Adventure 2 was designed to be run at 60 Hz, or 60 frames per second. If you have a newer monitor that does 75 Hz, or 120 hertz, or heaven forbid, even 240 hertz or above, then Sonic Adventure 2 is going to try matching that, which may double or even quadruple the speed of the game, making it very unplayable. This option will fix that, forcing the game to only run at its intended frame rate. In the Options tab, most of these can be left at their defaults. A lot of them should be pretty self-explanatory, like pause when inactive will freeze the game if you leave it running, but click outside the window. If you want, you can check the box for Disable Loading Animation. When they re-released Sonic Adventure 2 in 2012, they added brand new loading screen tips, but the game loads so quickly that you basically never get a chance to read them. Disabling them will make it look and function more like the old console versions. Not only that, but it was discovered that when you disable the loading screen animations, it actually makes the game load even faster. After all, in order to show the loading screen tips, they also have to be loaded themselves. Turning them off just makes the game run better. The 
one thing you should click though is this button here marked Enable One Click Install. Since most of the mods we're going to be talking about today are hosted on Game Banana, this will allow you to grab and install mod files instantly without having to mess with copying folders. It'll just put everything right where it needs to go automatically. However, a bit of a warning. You cannot just install mod files willy-nilly. Because multiple mods may be modifying the same data, you have to pay attention to whether or not there will be conflicts. If you're installing multiple mods that change, say, animations, well, they might not work together. That sounds scary, but usually mod authors will tell you if there's known conflicts in their file description on Game Banana. You just have to read carefully. And, at least as far as the mods go in this video, I'll tell you the exact order to load everything in to make sure that it all works together correctly. As long as you follow my instructions, everything will be fine. And if the instructions in this video here don't work, then just check the description and see if anything has changed. Okay, so now that you have the Sonic Adventure 2 Mod Manager installed and ready to go, let's talk about the 7 mods I consider essential. To start with, let's address the game's visuals. You may remember earlier when I said all later versions of Sonic Adventure 2 contained missing textures and broken lighting. To fix that, you're going to want to grab the Cutscene Revamp mod by Speeps Highway and End User. This is an extremely meticulous mod where Speeps and End User went through and manually fixed every single model, texture, and lighting effect in all cutscenes across the entire game. Scenes that look too dark or washed out? Proper brightness and contrast have been restored. Characters that look cross-eyed or have strange facial expressions? Now they look just like they did in the original Dreamcast version. Transparency problems have also been fixed. Some cutscenes have even been expanded so that they correctly display in widescreen now. It's incredible! To supplement this, you'll also want to grab the No Model Tinting mod, also by Speeps Highway. This will fix lighting on objects inside of levels during gameplay, once again restoring their proper brightness and contrast. Incidentally, shoutouts to Speeps Highway. Her work on both Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2 have gone a long way to improving a lot of quality of life stuff in the PC versions of these games. You're going to see her name come up a few more times before we're done here, and she always does stellar work. She also has a YouTube channel, and if you'd like to see a very long, very detailed video about every single change made to all of Sonic Adventure 2's cutscenes, she's got one you should watch. And while we're at it, shoutouts to many of the other names that come up in the modding scene for these games. All of you do great work. The next mod you're going to want is the SA2 Volume Controls mod by Shadatik. This mod goes a long way to fixing a lot of the sound mixing problems present in later versions of Sonic Adventure 2. It's user configurable, meaning you can tweak parts of the mod to your liking. Just install the mod, open the mod manager, select the Volume Controls mod, and click Configure. By default, music in Sonic Adventure 2 is often the loudest thing in the game, which, when you're jamming along to City Escape or Pumpkin Hill, can be great. But during cutscenes, it can make dialogue a little difficult to hear, so if I were you, I would go ahead and lower that number by just a little bit. That being said, I think the mod already balances the volume a little bit by default though, so if you don't want to mess with this setting, you probably don't have to. But it also does more than let you configure cutscene volume. It also fixes and restores a number of sound engine features that were broken in the PC version of Sonic Adventure 2. Sounds that were at the incorrect pitch now sound like they're supposed to, and stereo separation has been enhanced across the entire game, making it sound closer to the original Dreamcast version. Next, you want to grab the Highest Quality Textures mod, also by Speeps Highway. Now, if you're expecting upscaled, high-definition textures, that's not what this is about. Instead, this is about providing the highest quality, most uncompressed versions of every existing texture in the game. As Speeps outlines in the mod's description, that's because Sonic Adventure 2 often contains multiple copies of the same texture, and some versions of the texture are higher quality than others. So, what she did was go through and make sure every copy of every texture always uses the highest quality version available. 
It's not a huge upgrade, but it does make the game look better while also staying faithful to its original look. Next up is the Level Oddity patch by On Passant. I hope I'm saying that right. This is a simple fix that tightens up a lot of little problems across many of the game's levels. In all retail versions of Sonic Adventure 2, there exist objects that are either placed out of bounds or don't appear due to glitches in the level data. This has a variety of effects, like making certain score bonuses impossible. The level oddity patch cleans all that stuff up, while also doing things like fixing typos and the hints for the treasure hunting levels. Again, it's a small fix, but if you're looking for the highest quality experience, it's worth it. After that, I'd really recommend the Eggman Lighting Fix mod by Exent. One of the genuine improvements made to Sonic Adventure 2 on the GameCube was in levels like Iron Gate and Lost Colony. Here, Eggman's headlight on his mech actually lit up the dark environments. This effect was broken in the 2012 remaster, or at least it was on PC, and as you might guess, this mod fixes it so that his headlight once again works properly. Our final essential mod is something called Hedge Panel, once again by Speeps Highway. This contains half a dozen or so small little code tweaks to make your Sonic Adventure 2 experience as smooth as humanly possible. And it's completely configurable, so you can turn individual features on and off to suit your needs. The primary feature we're looking for in Hedge Panel is the modern style grind rails. This will make grinding on rails significantly easier. Unfortunately, as of this recording, there is no way to restore the original functionality of grind rails in the 2012 version of Sonic Adventure 2. However, by turning on modern style grind rails in Hedge Panel, we can mitigate how broken the grind rails are so that the leaning system no longer has any bearing on our ability to go fast. Or, in other words, it basically makes it so that grind rails in Sonic Adventure 2 work more or less the same way they do in Sonic Unleashed, Sonic Colors, and Sonic Generations. At the start of this video, when I mentioned I was being picky about a specific feature of this game, this is what I was talking about. Personally speaking, I would rather have a mod that restores grind rails to the way they worked in the original Dreamcast version of Sonic Adventure 2, but that doesn't exist as of this recording, and it may never exist. Though this mod does not fix the bugs associated with grind rails, for a large percentage of you out there, turning this mod on will be a significant improvement not only for the 2012 version of Sonic Adventure 2, but maybe even all versions of the game ever released. Instead of trying to finesse how Sonic and Shadow balance on a rail relative to their direction and speed, you just hold the X button down and go fast regardless. Hedge Panel also contains a number of other features as well, all of them enabled by default, so I'm going to run down what they all do real quick. Once again, just open the Mod Manager, highlight Hedge Panel, and click Configure down here to bring up this menu. Fast Somersault modifies Sonic and Shadow's Somersault. Normally, during a somersault, the game forces you to slow down a lot. Enabling this option just lets you keep your speed during a somersault. I'm a bit of a purist, and we have the spin dash anyway, so my personal preference is to disable this, but really it's up to you. We know what modern style grinding is, so leave that enabled. Random homing attack sounds adds a little more variety to the voice clips used during homing attacks for Sonic and Shadow. <laughs> Again, it's just my personal preference, but I turn this off. Homing attack at low heights just makes it so that you can initiate a homing attack even when you're very close to the floor, which is something you can't normally do. I can't say that I've ever run into a situation where this has been a problem, but I leave it on anyway. No low enemy bounces is something that does fix a problem I've run into, however. In several places in Sonic Adventure 2, you'll be presented with a string of enemies to use your homing attack on. Depending on when and how long you hold down the jump button, how far you get bounced up after destroying an enemy can change. The game isn't super clear on the way this works, since sometimes you can get bounced low and take damage for seemingly no reason. This just makes it so that all enemies always bounce you up the same height after being destroyed, and it makes the game feel a lot more consistent. I recommend leaving it turned on. Bounce up after a light attack is pretty self-explanatory. Like it says, you just get launched up after finishing a charged light attack rather than continuing forward. It's a small tweak, but it can save you from taking unfair damage in some circumstances, so I'd leave it turned on. Finally, automatic magic hands prompt and no magic orbs while running pertain to Sonic's secret final upgrade. I keep both of these disabled. 
With the automatic prompt turned on, you can use Sonic's magic hands upgrade to basically grab any nearby enemy as soon as they are in range. Which is overpowered enough, but if you turn both on at the same time, you can blast around levels mashing the action button at top speed, obliterating everything in sight without even touching it. It's a fun cheat code to mess with once, but it completely breaks the game in a way that stops being fun. So, like I said, I wouldn't use either of these. Not permanently, anyway. So there you go. There's your seven essential mods. Cutscene revamp, no model tinting, SA2 volume controls, high quality textures, oddity patch, Eggman lighting fix, and hedge panel. But there's still more mods we can talk about. Things that aren't absolutely necessary, but are fun to play around with regardless. So here's seven more totally optional mods that I'd also recommend. The first one is Smoother Wall Collisions by Hoppy Boppy Bunny. This mod could have a significant impact on the way you play Sonic Adventure 2. If you've ever had a character get caught on a wall and stopped just for brushing against it, this mod almost totally eliminates that. Touching walls means you simply slide along them smoothly now. It's great, but it's also the sort of thing where it might make it hard to go back to the original version someday. Since I love to be a purist, I'd also suggest looking into the Dreamcast character models by end user. As the name implies, this will restore the original, lower detail Dreamcast character models. You might think that's a downgrade, but there's more to it than that. This restores a lot of other things too, like the original animations from the Dreamcast version of Sonic Adventure 2. It also restores some of the original multiplayer skins too, like letting you play as Big the Cat in Eggman's mech. It also lets you use the holiday skins in single player too. You can even restore Sonic's classic shoes from the Dreamcast demo for that Sonic Adventure 2 prototype look, which is my personal favorite. Just download and use the mod manager to configure it. You might also want to grab the Disable Upgrade Models mod too. This one's by Main Memory, and really it does what it says in the title. If you thought your characters being covered in tons of gear looked weird, well, now you can turn all of that off and return them to their base visual style. It's fully configurable too, so you can disable specific individual pieces of gear. Personally, I like to turn off all of the upgrades for Knuckles, but leave him with his sunglasses. Though I should also point out that it doesn't always work on all cutscenes. In keeping with my tendency for purity, I've also installed the No Battle mod by Main Memory, which restores the Dreamcast version's intro and title screen. I mentioned this earlier, but you can also give the Better Radar mod by Kells, Kesnos, and Speeps Highway a look too. Not only does it fully restore the Emerald Radar behavior from the original Sonic Adventure, it adds new features too, like positional audio and more detection states to make finding the Emeralds easier. If you're using the cheat code version, you're going to want to turn that off first before using the mod, however. The last two mods go hand in hand for me, the first one being Character Select Plus by Justin113D, 11 3D, Main Memory, and Sora XY. This adds a new menu to the stage select map when you choose your level, and lets you play as any character in any level across the entire game. Want to play as Eggman in City Escape? You can do that. Want to see how Metal Sonic handles in Mission Street? You can do that too. You can even play as Tails outside of his mech if you so desire. To go with it, you should also grab the new Challenger's Assets mod by Neo and myself. Before the advent of the Sonic Adventure 2 mod manager, Neo created a special hacked build of Sonic Adventure 2 for the PC that allowed you to select other playable characters by holding down certain button combinations while the stage loaded. Bundled with this hacked version were a number of small graphical changes, including HD versions of the original Dreamcast item graphics created by yours truly. It was called Super Sonic Adventure 2 The New Challengers. With the Sonic Adventure 2 mod manager and things like Character Select Plus, Neo's new Challenger hack isn't really needed anymore, but he released some of the modified graphics here for those who still want them. Notably, this replaces all of the 1-Up character art with the generic 1-Up icon used in later games like Sonic Heroes, since if you loaded into a Sonic level as anyone other than Sonic, you'd be picking up 1-Ups with the wrong character's face on the item box. Also, biased as I may be, I just like the other item box graphics I made. <laughs> and those are our optional mods. Smoother wall collisions, Dreamcast characters, Disable upgrade models, No battle, Better radar, Character select plus, and the new Challenger's assets. But honestly, there's dozens of Sonic Adventure 2 mods out there. Recently, something called Modern Sonic Adventure 2 has gained some popularity 
for updating all of the character models, textures, sounds, and music. I personally don't really like mods like this because they tend to mess with the art direction a little too much in ways I don't usually agree with. Because, you know, again, I'm a purist, but maybe you aren't and maybe this looks interesting to you. There are also mods that add new costumes to the game, like playing as the VTuber Corone. People have modified player physics, retranslated all the subtitles from their original Japanese. Hoppy Boppy Bunny is even in the process of porting over stages from Shadow the Hedgehog. Perhaps most insane, there's even a mod out there that will make the multiplayer playable online, fittingly called Battle Network by Michael Fadley. That one probably deserves its own entire video, but I unfortunately don't really care for Sonic Adventure 2's multiplayer all that much. But just know that it's out there if you really want to try and figure it out and set things up for yourself. Just remember your mod load order. If something isn't working right, try disabling mods until you figure out where the problem is. As for the mods I've suggested for you in this video, here's my mod load order. No model tinting, cutscene revamp, disable upgrade models, no battle mod, Dreamcast characters, high quality textures, character select plus, hedge panel, oddity patch, Eggman lighting fix, Sonic Adventure 2 volume control, smoother wall collisions, better radar, and at the very bottom, the new challenger's assets. And just to repeat one last time, links and instructions will be included in the video description. There's definitely a part of me that's let down Sonic Adventure 2 cannot be made more accurate to its original version. You can't fix everything wrong with it, but in many ways I feel like with the mods I've given you here, it might actually be a better experience than the original game. Certainly a more forgiving experience, that's for sure, and that's coming from somebody who bought this game at launch on June 23rd, 2001. There are probably going to be some hardcore players out there who see these changes and think they make the game too easy now, and honestly, that's fair. Sonic games typically shine the brightest on their replay value, and Sonic Adventure 2 is a game that could take an expert player a very long time to master. Some of these mods and settings make the game a lot easier and lower that skill ceiling considerably, which can be a double-edged sword. Just while producing this video, I found it a little difficult to go back to the original Dreamcast version of Sonic Adventure 2. I'd spent so long playing the modded PC version that I'd gotten rusty at playing the game the quote-unquote right way. Now, obviously that's not going to matter to all of you, but it may matter to some of you. The fact that there's no official, accurate way to play this game is a pretty big bummer. If you want to play this game the way it was originally meant to be played, Sega does not give that to you, and at least as of this recording, neither do mods. Not entirely, anyway. The only real modern option is to emulate the Dreamcast version, but I don't really like suggesting emulation either. Regardless of what I myself engage in, I don't like publicly encouraging piracy, and setting up an emulator is such a long, complicated, involved process. Or it usually is, at any rate. There are a pair of Dreamcast emulators now that are actually fairly plug-and-play, one being ReDream and the other being Flycast. As long as you have the right game files, you can drop them in and play with very little setup required. Of the two, I find myself using Flycast more, since ReDream locks enhancement features behind a paywall. Flycast also runs on my 12-year-old Dell laptop, which won't even boot ReDream. At this point, I would not recommend playing the GameCube version of Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, and I would avoid using the Dolphin emulator for that one. Again, though the 2012 PC version of Sonic Adventure 2 is broken, most of what is broken about it was inherited from that GameCube release. If you emulate that version of the game, you're still getting the missing textures, bad lighting, and worse controls. So either you mod the PC version to fix it, or you play the Dreamcast version. That's it. That's my line in the sand. Those are the definitive ways to play Sonic Adventure 2. Which brings us to the end of the video. Hopefully you got something out of this, because I know it's a little more complicated than past videos I've made on game mods. 
Honestly, I started producing this video way back in September, figuring it would be quick and easy, but it's clear I deeply underestimated the amount of work it would take to write, organize, and record on top of all of the other problems I had during production. You might not realize it, but almost everything that could have gone wrong during production did, on top of it being the longest video I've ever put together. If you have a tech question about certain mods not working, you can try leaving a comment here, but like I said at the start of this video, I don't make these mods. I just tell you how to install them. If you're encountering a serious error, I'm probably not going to know how to fix it. If you really want tech support for these mods not working, uh, you're better off going over to Game Banana and leaving a comment there. Special thanks goes to everyone who supports me on Patreon. I've said this in like the last podcast thingy, but October was the most growth this Patreon has ever had since I opened it, which was, you know, really nice to see. A special shout out goes to Dragon, Minka Cola, Ed Boy, Gadget Feather, Jet Set Set, Keith Stack, Mark Bradshaw, Melko Driggs, Rose, Sam Bean, Setsune Wave, So Fox, and this dorky guy, who have all pledged $5 or more. If you'd like to pledge money, just head on over to patreon.com slash blazehedgehog. And don't forget to check out SNHU. You never know, this could be the start of something greater in your life. Just click on my offer code in the video description and sign up to receive your free information. It'll help you, and it'll also help me keep doing more videos like this one in the future. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one, which, depending on how things go, might take me a while. Thank you.